guys? Uh, Larry Hagner here with Dad Edge. Hope you're doing well. Number one, I just want to thank you for being a listener of the show, a follower of the mission. Been doing this now for six years, actually. As of today, as you watch this show, six years in the podcasting world. If you guys have been following me for any amount of time, you know that uh, I've done over 700 interviews. And my job as your podcast host is to really just give you guys a plethora and a buffet of different personalities, points of views, guests. Some are colorful, colorful and some are not. Uh, my guest today, it, today's an explicit show. Uh, there's a lot of F-bombs dropped, not by me, but by my guest. Uh, you know, if you're easily offended, I want to give you a heads up to make sure that you don't listen to this if you're easily offended. And if you're going to listen to this with kids in the car, this might not be the best fit for you. So um, the thing that I want to stress here, though, is that if you're going to listen to this show uh, and you're easily offended, I will tell you, look at this through the, through the lens of curiosity and maybe curiosity around what exactly is at play here? Like, what's the message here? And I think if you get to the heart and soul of what Wes does, he really just doesn't tolerate excuses from people that he works with or his himself. That's his mentality. And I have met very few people with this type of attitude, but some of them are the most successful people on the planet because they, they don't tolerate excuses. They just go out and execute. And in some way, shape, or form, maybe we could take that Maybe not this much of as, as an extreme approach, but we can take that and we can utilize these things in our own lives. But I want to give you guys a heads up and a fair warning of what you're about to hear is not the norm on Dad Edge as far as explicit language, but um, I've had other guests on before like Garrett White and Andy Frisella and, and many others uh, who are very colorful and very loud, but they still serve a decent message to a lot of our audience. So without, without further ado, let's just get right to the podcast. Wes, what's up, man? Welcome to Dad Edge, brother. Yeah, buddy. Love being here. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, man. We're going to talk about mindset. We're going to talk about some fitness. We're going to talk about some marriage, some dad stuff, the whole nine yards, man. So, hey, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's start out with some, some break the ice kind of fun questions. You up for that? I'm down. I'm down for whatever. All right. All right. So, when you're not getting like completely yoked in the gym, obviously you are, and not getting some ink or hanging out with your son and wife and all that good stuff. What's, what's one thing that you really like to do that just, just brings you joy. I, I'm, I'm the worst. It's probably just food. Like I'm so, I'm so simple. I diet so hard that the dumbest pleasure that someone else would overlook would bring me the biggest joy. But I, I, I like cars. I, I'm a car guy. I have some, some cars and stuff. So just a quick drive, watch the sunset, grab a steak. I mean, I don't need much more than that after a hard day's work. And, um, and doing stuff with the fan, you know? Nice, man. So tell us uh, what kind of cars do you, do you drive? What kind I, of cars do you got? It's, it's dumb. I, I barely got out of prison like three years ago. And I, I have like a Rolls Royce Wraith. I have a Lamborghini Urus. I have a Mercedes S-Class, a G-Wagon. And um, I, I like like high-end like luxury vehicles. It's just, I grew up so poor. My parents had that green, pistachio green station wagon where you guys were facing the cars behind you. And like here, me and my brother are sitting there looking at the cars back here. And we were just always so embarrassed to get dropped off at school. I swear I probably have trauma from being dropped off in the vehicles my parents used to drive. And this probably caused me to be like this. I bet all those people who hate on people who have nice cars drove to school as kids in nice cars. So they don't have problems with that. No, man, you're preaching to the choir. We, I, um, it's bad. We, I used to, my, my grandpa used to, he had one of those ginormous station wagons and it was, uh, I mean, it had the wood paneling, man. Oh yeah. And yeah. we were in the back, like we used to go on fishing trips and that kind of thing. And me and like a buddy would sit in the back and we'd be like, you know, waving at cars. It was just the weirdest thing. It's like, how long am I going to face this person? Right. That's yeah, right behind us. Like that Chuck and Chase movie. You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, man. Now, the worst, the worst story is when my dad, my dad was a construction worker, the hardest dude you've ever met. Like never from like 16 to this day, worked plastering every day, no days off, just worked his life to the covered in cement, leave at 5 a.m., come back at 5 or 6, just blasted. This, this man, 6'5", 280 his whole life, and just a beast, you know? And he comes to pick my brother up from high school, and he's like, 
that he doesn't know that this side of his car has a bunch of pictures taped on it that shouldn't be exposed to public. You know, so the guys at his work put a bunch of nude pictures on this side of his car. And my dad's driving on this side. He got in on this side and he goes to pick my brother up from high school. He's like, hey, hey, over here. And he doesn't know there's pictures all along the side of his car. My brother's like, what? What are you, what, what are you doing? It's probably, it's, it's a good story. So wait, your dad's six five and he's like, what? he's like six five, like just he's like Paul Bunyan. People are always like, how your arms get so big? I'm like, dude, my dad had twenty twos on the hang genetically without ever hitting weights. He never did a workout program. He just literally was a plaster, just towing hose, feeding the gun, and we just grew up that lifestyle, just extreme uh, blue collar. Just I, I mean, I never, never had a job in my life, but when I did work. As a kid, I would go to work with my dad, but ever I've never actually had a job in my entire life unless I was the person who owned the company or did the business. Nice, man. It was was it just you and your brother growing up? It's just me and my brother and uh, my dad, and my mom. Mom and dad are still together. I don't know how, but yeah, they're still together. How long they've been together? It's uh, gotta be since I it was like since I was, you know, since my brother was like seventeen. So I mean, uh, they're it's gotta be forty years or something. Dang man, what what do you think? I can't is, remember my birthday. If I if I can remember my parents, how long they've been married, I'd be a genius, man. I, I right. Can't so, uh, what do you think has kept them together? Man, it just you know, my family's just loyal. We're just we're just like just how my dad had that work ethic. The way we do anything is the way we do everything. He's a committed man. That's it. I mean, they have many things that should have made them not make it by today's standards. But he's just a committed man. Same thing as myself. I'm committed to anything I do. I mean, I, I can essentially do whatever I want in my financial position and who I am. But I, I choose to be a husband and a father. And me and my wife have had massive hurdles in our a little over like 16 months of marriage. It's been crazy. But um, you know, we two imperfect people refusing to give up on each other. Simple as that. Man, you couldn't have put that any better. Two imperfect people that refuse to give up on each other. That my friend. I tell people, people always have problems with like choices I make because I'm a public figure. And I'm like, wait, 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 let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. You guys know my past and you're not vilifying me, but you guys do this to all these people. Like they did something that was a fraction of who I used to be and you're not forgiving them. Why? Is it the timeline? Like fast forward a couple months. You're not going to care about this. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's one thing when you're in the limelight like that, that, uh, I mean, the, the haters definitely come out of the woodwork, but man, I, I, I definitely want to, I want to talk about, you know, your childhood growing up with your brother and your dad. Let's, let's talk about that very thing. Let's talk about work ethic. Do you, uh, what, what type of lessons did you learn from your dad about work ethic? I just, I literally, I believe in acquiring what we admire. And I just watched this man just be such a dedicated individual and work so hard. I looked at him like he was just, he was a superhero, but he was massive. And so when we got around all the other dads, everybody like big Ken, like fuck KW, you know, big Ken, savage. Like nobody messes with this guy. And so I always like admired that and everyone else did. So that was something that became part of me that I wanted to be a hard worker and I wanted to be a big dude, you know? And so I, I just, even at like 14, I was a little bit just thicker than everybody else. And I, I was like even embarrassed like my forearms and embarrassed like my chest and stuff because I had a little bit of fat. I didn't know how to diet yet. And then I told my mom, I said, drive, drive me down to Barnes & Noble. This is when they had bookstores. Like you couldn't just be on the internet. You had to go to the store. So then anyway, she drives me down to Barnes & Noble and I get the bodybuilding encyclopedia by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, and man. this was my life. These guys were just massive dudes. And I read that thing cover to cover a million times over. And I just started going to the gym at like 14. Like I did school to go to the gym. And then once I, I just kept going and kept going until uh, now I was shopping for macro specific meals for my family by like 15, 16. And I'm still shocked how successful dudes out here haven't connected the fact. They all say you are what you eat, but they haven't connected the fact that the proper allocation of macronutrients and understanding that having guesswork in your diet causes you to just massively drop the ball of life is, is a huge problem. And they, they continue to sign up my program like, what are macros? And it's just macronutrients are fats, proteins, and carbs. If you don't have the correct 
percentage of fats, proteins, and carbs to correct grams for your desired results, you will not get them. So you can work out as much as you want. And if you don't have the correct macros, it's not happening. And me being in prison for so long, I was able to build a lot of muscle off less food than people believe. So my, the way I do my macros are much different than everybody else's. And that's why if you look at my results on my Instagram, Watson underscore fit, you'll see that I get crazy results in anyone way quicker because I'm aggressive with the diet. I'm aggressive with the diet and that gets the results quicker instead of people who ride the line and they try to placate people. So a lot of people in the fitness industry try to, oh, you can eat that. You can have what you like. This is Jenny Craig. You get pizza and ice cream. No, you ain't getting that on my program. Guess what? I'm going to make you strong. I'm going to make you tough. I'm going to make, I'm going to build that fortitude in you where you're just mentally aware enough to say that don't even suit me. And when I seek those pleasures, my discipline drops in all areas of life. I'm not just able to consume these foods and then not fall victim to my triggers when they come later. Everything is a test of purpose over pleasure. And in your diet, you have four to seven times a day, depending on who you are, your size, whatever, to choose purpose over pleasure. Now, when we choose purpose over pleasure in our diet four to seven times a day, guess what? We habitually construct someone who has a neurological pathway to choose purpose over pleasure in our heart areas. We're talking in the drinking, in the anger, in everything else. So this is what we're really doing. I'm attaching deep intention through diet and exercise to mindset training. So we have a bigger overview of how this affects your whole life. You know, I'm glad you said that. purpose over pleasure. So let me ask you this. <laughs> what, what do you say to a guy that's like, hey man, can you give me some motivation? I, I need motivation. I tell him, remember what you said, you know, but I, I, I do, um, I, I literally, it's the first step. So the first win he takes, the first win he stacks in the morning is going to propel him forward. But literally, I, I just don't even look your, go look your son in the face, motherfucker. Like what motivation do you need? Do you really not want your son to look at you like, like dad's a superhero? My wife and son look at me like, who is this guy? What, what is this? Like, like let's, let's stack everyone up the line and be objectively optimistic. Are they going to pick you? Are you it? Exactly. So if you're not in, in the line of dad stacked up, do you want your kid listening to someone else? I really want everybody's kid to listen to me. I do, because I know I got the right info for them. I'm the right role model. But I mean, I want to build other dads to have the same purpose over pleasure knowledge with their own intensity, their own delivery, so that when their kid looks around, they're like, well, my dad's got it all. He gets it. I listen to my dad. I don't listen to these dudes on TV or this weird stuff around me. The biggest problem is kids don't have a good rite of passage nowadays. Yep. So dad's not giving a rite of passage. He's not like, no, son, it's character. No, son, it's work, work ethic. Yes, we have money, son. Yes, we have cars. But it's the internal attributes that got that. It's the internal attributes that made us different. It's not that we're so favored. We're not special. We earn it. And I mean, it's just really about giving your kids the right rite of passage or else you end up like me. My dad was a hard worker. My, my dad was a beast. He didn't teach it right. He didn't say Wes because he didn't have money. He made money a problem in my heart because he didn't make enough. So I felt his pain every month that he couldn't really pay the bills or have what he wanted. He wasn't smart enough to make the money or disguise that and say, we don't need that. We have character. We work hard. So what did I do? I, I sensed money being a, a problem in my parents' life. So I sought out to solve it. So at 11, I'm selling drugs. By 16, I'm buying a, my dream car, cash. By, by 18, I'm a millionaire. By 24, I'm in prison for 10 years because I was chasing money because I didn't have the right rite of passage about money and I had trauma attached to my parents never being able to pay the bills. And it wasn't big. There was just a lingering pain each month about money. So me having a strong work ethic, wanting to be a strong man, I said, mom and dad, I'm going to get this money for us. I got it the wrong way and got it handed to me. Yeah, man. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about being 24 years old, being incarcerated. What, what did that do to your emotional and mental mentality at that point in your life? I mean, I, I always had like real strong self-talk. I was actually a pro snowboarder before I went to prison. I had a pro work ethic 
I have always had like a high sense of self worth, high self image that was created by putting the work in. The work instills the worth, and I always put the work in. So I had worth, but I had the wrong direction. So once right. I went to pr- I went to prison for wrong direction, but at least when I hit prison, I had g- a great self image. I had self esteem, and I had a high value of self because I'm ready to do these push ups, bro. What's up, homeboy? I'm ready to work out. Are you? So since there was a way to validate myself in prison through the way we worked out, the way we got up early, the way we programmed, how clean we were, who we were, how we conduct ourselves, our word, whether we use drugs or not, I was able to validate myself from a prison program and a hierarchy that was militant. And that militant structure actually helped me a lot. But a lot of guys go in and they don't have that. They don't have the self-image. They don't have the self-esteem. So when they're about to put the work in, they don't have the work ethic either. So they're too weak and they're like, I'm nothing. I'm not even good at working out. I, I don't believe in myself. I'm this, I'm that. So then they turn to drugs because the work's too hard for them. Because over time, they have eventually constructed a soft ass motherfucker from continually choosing comfort over actually building someone. Got it. Yeah. So you were there for 10 years, right? 10 years, yeah. All, so, seven different prisons, three different states. I mean, hellacious time. People tell me their war stories about like a, a 72 hour hold or something. I'm like, I'm like, bro, I'm like, it, tough guy, you can't do 10. Nobody can. I couldn't do it. You can. You just do one day at a fucking time. And literally, that's why I got so good at stuff out here. I mastered each day. I wasn't about some long view plan. I was literally about the moment. And curing my pain in the moment, I had a lot of pain and I just channeled that pain into the work I would put in doing what I could with what I had, where I was at. And that was building my body and building my mind through uh, self-help books, reading a lot of quotes, applying them and holding myself to stuff that was so difficult that it would just make me someone who could weather anything. And I just, I really choose the hardest route possible because that, that soft route just turns into a steady decline. The perpetual pleasure chasing, even if it start off with pancakes in the morning for me. If I woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to have my favorite awesome breakfast, that, that would be such a downfall for me. And people don't realize this is a downfall for them. I would have that breakfast. It would be awesome for a second. Then I would have let myself down in the vision I have for self. Now I don't feel good about myself. I'm not moving where I need to go. And if I'm not strong enough at that moment to reflect on what I did, then I'm going to project how I feel. So those that don't reflect, they project. So if I'm not in that moment quick enough to reflect and catch it, which I am, but most people are, I would be, I would tell my wife, if I'm about to eat something like that, hey, like, I shouldn't eat this. I'm going to be a dick. And she's like, why? I'm like, well, because then I'm not in alignment with my goals. I'm letting myself down. When I let myself down, I'm more likely to see let down in others. And so that's why I teach people to cultivate a high level of self-love, self-worth in themselves so they can see love in others. But that's where everyone messes up. They don't reflect, so they project. And they don't realize they're consistently letting themselves down in some area so that the close ones in their life and everybody around them, they're letting them down too. But really, they're just seeing that that's their flawed perspective because they're not in true alignment with their actions, their energy, and their subconscious thoughts. So, I mean, the, the main part is, is I have to live a hard life to deter myself from falling victim to my weaknesses and my vices. I refer to anger as a vice. You're like, why? How's anger a vice? Anger is a vice because at first it gives me initial pleasure and then I regret it. And so this is what all vices do. Run to some alcohol. First it's some pleasure, then we regret it massively. And the same thing is with anger me. I'm going to get angry at people because I let myself down and now I'm going to regret it later. So the point is, is I have to stay hard. I have to stay militant. I have to stay structured or my weaknesses come in because I'm not disciplined enough to choose the positive thought that led to the positive action, the positive result over the negative thought that led to the negative action to the negative result. I know that's a massive mouthful, but I, 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 I process stuff very fast. I've gone through all these topics so many times and live them so thoroughly every day that they mean the world to me when I can tell someone that. Those that don't reflect, project, and then they can see that they're doing that to their loved ones. I can solve a lot of problems with relationships and even mine in them. And one day that a man could say, 
I am projecting. She's not really dropping the ball. She's not really doing anything wrong. This is me. When I can do that for someone, that makes my life. I got the chills right now because it just makes my life when I can do that because that behavior fucked my life up from an early, early age. Was there, was there a moment when you were in prison that, you, I mean, you didn't have this mindset? Was there a flip that switched or yeah, switched I, flipped? How about that? I, uh, I, used, I, I was still engaged in like all the super negative stuff in prison. So, I mean, it, it, name it, you know. So everyone in prison is selling drugs. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of bullshit. People are dying of overdoses just so people can get ahead and have extra coffee, soups, and meat logs and make spreads and have extra luxuries in their locker and act like the big dog because they got some money on some green dot cards or some prepaid debit cards. And the thing is, is it's just sickening. And um, after just seeing the fault of that lifestyle, reading some books like Napoleon Hill Outwitting the Devil, uh, believing in karmic debt thoroughly because I watched it take place and uh, just wanting to be a better man because I tried everything negative. None of it worked. I tried everything negative. It didn't work. And I'm like, I, I just can't do this anymore. I'm sick of looking at myself in the mirror in a negative way. I'm just done. I, I want to be proud of myself. I want to make my mom proud. But really the main turning point was when I almost caught a life sentence incarcerated, when um, I caught an A1, 115, which is um, assault with a deadly weapon, with a great bodily injury. It's a murder or a attempted murder in-house while in prison. And that led me to a 14 month uh, shoe term, which was the security housing unit, the prison inside of the prison. And that's when I, I thought they were going to put me on another case because I had two strikes already. I actually had four strikes, but just two on this case that I was riding on. And I thought they were going to take me, uh, the DA was going to pick it up and they were going to give me a third strike and I was going to get life. And the captain came and showed me the pictures of the, the victim in the case. And I mean, he was massacred, you know, so I'm like, oh, I'm done. Like that looks like a horror movie. I'm totally done. And they luckily they didn't pick it up because there was a riot at the time and a lot of attempted murders were handed out. And so um, they just didn't pick up my case. So then I, I got off with a 14 month shoe, which is in the shoe. You do 85% of your time too, unless you get in trouble. So I did 11 months, eight days. And um, this was in segregation, but you have a celly. You, every time you leave your cell, it's handcuffed. And then you go to a cage outside to work out there. And you never leave your cell for 23 hours a day, except to go to this cage to work out. And then you go to the shower, you get locked in the shower too as well. And um, at that time, I, I'm like, I'm changing. And uh, I, I swore to change right then. And then the thing was, is probably about two years later, I relapsed again on drugs in there and I uh, got my ass beat really bad. And uh, that was really the last time I ever used it. I drank some Pruno, like some prison wine, and I did some drugs and I, I caused a, a fucking problem and then Two of my own people, because in California, there's prison politics. The problem I caused, I, I had beat up my bunkie one-on-one -on -one in an area close to other races. And um, so I had to get disciplined. I was, I was next up. And so then two people who I had beat up before got to discipline me. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to fuck both of you guys up. What's up? Let's do this. And so they rearranged the racks everywhere. Uh, they wait till the cops walk. Some people like stand right there and block the view. And we're like, okay, let's do this. And I'm going to fuck both these guys up in my head. Like, they're both not like me. Like, nobody in prison is like me. They don't look like me. These are movies. They took the weights out. You have to be really smart to build muscle, muscle with body weight or really genetically blessed. I'm naturally, like, 240. And when I cut up, I'm, I'm 225, 230 and ripped. And I understand how to diet. So I'm like, I'm going to fuck these dudes up. And then one of them just jumps down, grabs my legs, and the other one just starts blasting me in the face. And they fuck me up. But I was so just embarrassed and burnt and coming down off a of drug high and drinking that I quit and I never turned back. I've been sober since that day, which has been about eight years, seven, eight years. I don't know. I'm not one of those dudes who counts the day. I don't remember the day. I just remember I was fucking done. Man, that's unreal. And so 10 years go by, you're, you, you get out. Right. You go through this transformation when you're, when you're in prison, it sounds like you were, you were reading books, uh, seven habits of highly effective people. I've heard you talk about that on other shows. He's a beast. Yeah, man. He's awesome. And also outwitting the devil. 
Uh, what were some other books that really started changing your mindset? Uh, Steve Siebold, 177 Habits, uh, 177 Mental Toughness, Secrets of the World Class. That one's gold. And then, I, you know, I read like Marcus Aurelius and Meditations. I read a lot of Stoic philosophy. And then I just read a lot of quotes. I'm a firm believer in reading quotes, applying them to your life, and uh, just really sitting in the stream of consciousness. I wake up in the morning and just sit with myself. Like I, I tap into infinite intelligence by being massively grateful and I vibrate, I vibrate super high. I can feel it. I don't care what anyone thinks. It's about shaping your perspective. And if you get up with a grateful heart every day, wake up early to be your best and you're seeking personal growth and you've given up on all these vices and you don't wake up with these massive regrets anymore. And you're just, I'm going to be my best. Today. I'm going to put everything into it. I love this life. And you really live that for a long period of time you have a connection to above like nobody's ever seen before. And it's just that true alignment, that that true universal connection and obeying these universal truths has just has changed my life. It's, it's what you believe in that, that gets you to do what you gotta do. And a lot of people don't realize like to break a bad habit, you just have to find something you love more than the habit. And I wanted love so bad that whole time in prison. I just wanted love so bad, I was so lonely that I just decided to give it to myself. So every morning I just woke up and I love myself. I invested in myself and I didn't give myself no fucking slack. And that's what I believe love is. It's hard truths with self, no fucking slack to really create what needs to be created. People think love is a fucking Epsom salt bath and a candle. Fuck you, motherfucker. Love is really pulling some shit off. This ain't fucking a spa date, motherfucker. Life's gonna come. Life's gonna come kicking at your door. Or do, you, do you love yourself enough to stand up when everything falls apart? I see these cupcakes out here, these soft ass motherfuckers. They can't even handle a diet and a workout. That could, there's plenty of people in different countries who would give their life for that one day of your diet food. And they'll never eat that day that you're complaining about, you bitch. And there's plenty of people in the penitentiary who would just, it would, they wouldn't even leave that weight room. They'd be like, oh, well, 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 it would be Disneyland to them. Flawed perspective is what's going on out here. Comfortable fucks who just think shit's going to be handed to them. It ain't going to be. Damn. So you mentioned in there faith, and I also see you've got, you've got a tattoo of Christ on yeah, you. I really, just go, I really just go with like universal connection. I don't yeah. know. I, don't, I can't say I know. I know, I know, I know someone's talking to us. I know our conscience is, I know our conscience is the voice of the universe, the voice of God. I just know it is. And it's our path. Our conscience is our guideline. I like to tell people right between the call of our conscience and the guidance of regret is the exact path we need to walk. Now, you can sit down for a fucking second and put YouTube down. You can put your fucking snacks down and shit. You can really listen within and be like, what's my conscience telling me? I need to drop 15. I shouldn't be drinking all these beers. And then here's your regret. Man, I wish I didn't talk to my wife like that yesterday. I don't, I shouldn't be drinking these beers. Oh, well here, let's just focus in on that for now. The beer's gotta go, motherfucker, step up. And then when we do that to many things throughout our 90 day program that I, I set up for you or the year long program, you get rid of all this shit that's been holding you back your whole life. Motherfuckers think it's a hack, not habits. I got here in the nicest penthouse downtown with a great life, everything I could ever imagine, I could go get right now and do right now because of habits, habits, no hack. Yeah, so talk to us about your habits. What does your day look like? I'm 245. I've got up at 245 every morning for 13 years. I won't bend on it. Everybody in my life can go before 245 goes. That's how rigid it is. Everyone can go if they have a problem with it. Because guess what? I'm not going to be a good man if I'm not in the gym by four. I'm not going to be the man that they need. So I have to be the man they need. So I'm gonna be in the gym by four, working out by four, even on a lockdown when the gyms are closed, I'm doing burpees in my house at four. I have to push myself hard. That does one of two things. What it does is keep me from staying up late, doing the shit that you shouldn't be doing out there. We're not nocturnal creatures. We shouldn't even be up that late anyways. First off, nothing gets done at those times. And second off, that puts me right in the window, which I figured out later is the time that we're most in alignment to our purpose, which is 3.40 a.m. I haven't realized for about 10 years, 
I was writing every day at 3.40 a.m. And then I talked to people through my friend Brian Rose and other people like uh, Saguru who's on his show that there's power attached to 3.40 a.m. that a lot of cultures talk about. That's where we're most in alignment with our purpose in life. And there's just a high level of attachment to universal connection and universal truths and infinite intelligence at that point. People who don't believe in this stuff, that's why they're where they're at. They don't see the answers. They don't feel them. When I overeat my, my macros, when I don't stick to all my daily plans, I'm not in alignment with where I'm going with my purpose. I don't feel everything around me. When I'm in complete alignment, a hug feels greater with my wife. When I'm in complete alignment, the words on the page bring tears to my eyes. When I fucking woof down a bunch of carbs the night before, I don't even, can't even read the fucking book. I'm like, what? The fuck's this book? And the thing is, is it's very easy to wake up at 2.45 when you're fucking starving. The reason these pussies can't get up is because they neck six burgers before bed. Trust me, if I'm getting you ripped as fuck, you'll be up at 1.30. Like, is it 2.45 yet? I'm hungry as fuck. Like, that's what I do. I'm up at two, like, I didn't go have this shape. Like, and I wake up and see veins in my abs. You know, this is what's going on. I'm literally needing to get up and eat. This is how we're supposed to do it. Because when we're hungry, we fight. A lot of pussies out here, just comfortable dudes who are okay with their low ass level. Then they see me pull up in this Lambo I just bought cash, like it's something. I'm like, motherfucker, you just chose a low level a long time ago. I ain't even started and I'm definitely not comfortable and I ain't getting comfortable anytime soon. We're going to hit these next levels this year, like never, never before seen. Cause we see, we see the hurdles as what needs to be done. The obstacles are the path. Two, so talk to us about the 340 mark. You got me curious. Oh yeah. Well, a lot of people speak on 340 AM as like the optimal time that you're most in alignment. And as I teach people in my program to get up earlier and earlier and earlier, as they diet really hard, as they remove all their vices, as they stick to their workout program, as we instill this character and intention to purpose in them, they're like, dude, I'm just always up at this time. I'm always up at this time. What's going on? I'm like, yeah, you're getting closer to it. You're, you're right there. I write the most profound shit my whole life right around that time. I, it's just not happening at other times. The world's up. I mean, you got the distractions of the day. People don't really get where they want to go in life because they wake up right into their family. Like they don't even have time to compose any complex thought or anything deep. They're not even able to miss them. Like they're just going from family to family to family to family. It's like, dude, like wake up and sit there and look at the pictures of your kids alone in the morning with a song on that really brings out some emotion. Fucking wake up right. Like wake up into some pain overcome it and then see the beauty of overcoming Damn. I force that shit on me I'll literally be going through something and I'll just pull up the video of my son that makes me just bawl and I'll put on like the worst song that anyone wanted to avoid that reminded them of their grandma and I, I'll just go straight into it I'll just be like what <laughs> this is, I, I, just, I, I know that emotional motivators are our true sense of power because that's why a mom can lift a, a car off her son when he's trapped. I mean, this is emotional motivation. She's, there's not, nothing that could stop her. I live there. I, I was, um, it's a highly charged emotional place in the penitentiary. And the people who drown that out, that's how I tell addicts. I'm like, you're going to be the most powerful when you get past that. The reason you need to do heroin and drink this much is because you have so much emotion. When you harness that emotion, you're going to be all powerful. They, you, know, they, you, you know, you're talking to obviously an audience full of fathers out there. And what I can tell you, and you already know this, you've been in this, this field for a long time. One of the things that a man will sacrifice right out of the gate when he gets married and has a kid or kids is his health, physical, mental, emotional, sometimes spiritual. I don't know what, but we always, we always seem to shelve that. And we always seem to think that it, it comes out of this noble place, right? But nothing could be more sacrificial. And I mean, the more powerfully we take care of ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically, and we're going to show up and lead people in a more profound way. What, what do you have to say about that? 
it's massively selfish and they just don't understand what they're doing. Yeah. So they're, they're not personifying the teaching. So they're telling their kids to be healthy, but they're not. They're coming up and giving their kid a hug, saying they love them, and they don't love themselves enough for the exchange to be real. When I tell someone I love them, it's greater because I love myself more, and I don't give a fuck to say it. I love myself more than the fat dad who's got the 18 pack. Yeah, he loves his son. He does. At the capacity at which he knows love to be, which is fucking minute with his pop belly and his 18 pack and his zero fucking results in life. Yeah, he loves him. His capacity for love. My capacity of love is 13 years of grinding to create a fucking lifestyle that is a dream for everybody. And for me to fucking serve my family like the man should. I tell him, anything I can do after this call, I run to my wife. Anything I can do for you, babe? Son, what's up? What can I do? I'm of service to them or I'm working to serve them. That is it. The morning, I'm selfish. I'm selfish in the morning. I'm building me, but I'm only selfish so that I can be selfless the rest of the day. I'm creating this individual that can serve better the rest of the day. So I'm essentially doing it all for selfless means to be able to serve the world better. I tell people our life's purpose. And people are like, I've never heard someone say what all our life's purpose is. All of our life's purpose is to create the individual we admire in all ways so that we can just give that individual away. And that's what we're doing here. I mean, people are just missing and dropping the ball. You're lazy. You're feeding your kid that food. Like you're, you're literally setting your kid up for failure. You're going to send your kid to high school fat or you're just going to be all fat. And you're literally going to be all overweight and unhealthy and not think your kid's going to emulate that. Kids always fail to listen to their parents. They never fail to emulate them, ever, ever. It just never happens. And the fact is, is even these overweight parents or these, these people who let their health go, they don't realize that in public at the beach, the pool or all these places that they, they preach, it's about family. It's not about going to the gym and being fit. I'm about family. They don't realize when they're really at the event with their family, they're not present at all. Because their internal dialogue, their self-talk is so fucking self-centered and selfish. They're not even there at the beach. You really think a fat-ass mom is present? No, she ain't. You think some fat-ass dad is present at the beach? No, he's all worried about his pot belly and his titties. He ain't really playing ball with his son. He probably won't even go to the beach. How many dads won't even take their shirt off at the beach? Pussy. Literally. Step the fuck up, dude. Like, be an example. Like, have your kid look at you like Damn, dad, whoa. Like, I don't care what I got to do. Oh, what? I just got to eat those macros, Wes? Got you. Love my son. Done. That's it. Everyone overcomplicates you. Oh, no, but it's hard. Like, I'm busy. I'm this, I'm that. I'm busier than you, bro. I'm busier than you. Okay, I got more going on than you. Okay? The problem is, is you don't comprehend how to eat correctly. I can make your kids food. The same foods that your kid likes he won't even know the difference and he'll be massively fit when we feed him these foods macro specific for the next seven to 10 years. And he goes to high school just on point and he's happy, he's healthy, he feels good. The same, he wouldn't even know the difference. You're just too stupid and too lazy to understand there's ways to do this. Yeah. So you, you have a son. He's what, two and a half? Two, like a little over two. A little over two. Hey, what would you name him, by the way? His name's Wolf. Wolf? Yeah, he's actually my stepson, but he's my son. Okay, okay. Wolf. <laughs> That's a badass name. No, um, he's got, I'm going to bring him in here. He's shit. You should, man. You should. I mean, his name is almost as cool as Larry. Almost, but yeah. You know. <laughs> it's borderline, like they're people. They're, it's a hard time. Yeah, yeah, man. So let, let's talk about Wolf for a second, man. That's the only time I'll probably ever smile. I'll, I'll be looking like way too hard and everything and then you talk about him and I look like an idiot. I'm just smiling too much. No, man, that's what, that's what the kids do to us, man. So talk, talk to us about him. So he's two. Uh, what, what is your hope? to teach this young man as he navigates life. And it's just going to be me. It's just going to be about personifying the teaching. It's, it's literally going to be about keeping him away from vices, like showing him just really, your dad went through it. What's up? Like, this is what's going to happen. Like really teaching to build these internal attributes, the discipline, the work ethic, the character. And it's going to be about building all the internal attributes that create the external world instead of seeking the external world. Everyone seeks the external game, 
but they're not about the internal attributes that actually get that. So what, what they don't realize is you need to just create someone of value and success will chase you instead of trying to chase success. So I'm just going to teach them to be a valuable individual. I mean, it, which is, which is mind, body, soul. I mean, you can't just get up there and give people life advice like half these people on TV and on shows and shit with tits and looking like a bag of shit and just being like, hey, uh, I got this plan for us. Motherfucker, shut up. Shut the fuck up. And they're like, why? It's obvious you had a plan for your weight loss and your, and your, and your training and stuff and not looking and feeling like that. And you gave up on it a long time ago. Go address that and come back, homeboy. It's 2021. We can do it all. We can the knowledge is there. And these people got these big quotes and all this wisdom and their posts and all their stuff. Wisdom's unbiased. If you said it in one area, it's applicable. It's applicable across the board. Done. It's that easy. So when you talk about building like work ethic and when you talk about building character and all these things, I'm really interested in, in the how. How can we replicate that as fathers? It's, it's really simple. It's, it's really about what I teach people in my program, the wake up time, the workout, the choosing. It's about attaching intention to the things that we see as seemingly insignificant. So it's a different definition. You don't say, here's your diet, son. You say, son, this is how you build discipline. The food is discipline. Here's your, this ain't your wake up time, son. This is how we show how grateful we are. It's a different definition. What they did to society is they defined everything so fucking stupid. Here's your diet. Negative. Diet's just automatically negative in your head. But if you're like, this is how we get our discipline. Oh, discipline. I want discipline. This is how we get discipline. The workout. This is how we gain quality energy. This is how we raise our rate of vibration. This is how we get a positive mindset. Instead of, this is how we get abs. Well, they told me people shouldn't judge me anymore. They're superficial if I have to look a certain way. Well, people do judge you, sorry, but give them a different definition. This is how we get that positive mental attitude. Because I really go for that. I really change the definition of everything for what I go for. I go to the gym to get a positive mental attitude because I wake up negative as fuck. I just do. I'm an intense dude. I believe we all wake up negative. Some people just don't have a higher calling like me or like other people because in all reality, if you were to create a species like we were created, would you make that species that you wanted to evolve and flourish? Would you have them wake up feeling so perfect and so great? Or would you have them wake up feeling negative and have to earn through certain acts that build and evolve them positivity? Yes, this is how it was done. So everybody wakes up negative. Some people are just so unaware and so drowned out. They don't get that they do. And they're big time motherfucking liars. Oh, no, I'm positive. Well, if you were positive, I'd see a lot of positive forward motion. And I don't see it. So get the fuck out of here, you liar. I just see through everybody's bullshit. And the fact is, we all wake up negative. We were created that way so that we evolve. If we woke up just feeling so perfect and everything was awesome, then we'd be the guy on the couch. We wouldn't have to do anything. We already feel perfect. Damn. So you wake up negative? Yeah, always. Like, I, so what, I, what goes through your mind? What goes through your mind? I'm just, I'm just, I mean, I'm happily dissatisfied. I wake up, I don't like the position I'm in. I need to do more. I can be in better shape. I can't, no, nobody will, nobody is like, nobody wants to wake up fatter and more broke tomorrow. If you went around the, the building and said, who wants to wake up tomorrow having gained 10 pounds of fat and lost a significant amount of money? No one would raise their hand. So I guess we have to be the opposite, right? That everybody wants to be fair and wants to have more financial success, wants to have less pain in their heart. I mean, so the point is, is I, I just wake up in a state. I really feel like the people who wake up with more pain, more emotion, they're meant for more. They, they're being called to something greater. And that calling is due to the intensity of the pain or negativity. Because the adversity introduces a man to himself. And when we're building a man, we need friction. If there's no friction, nothing's going to happen. A spoiled ass kid is just going to slowly deteriorate himself. So I just, I just honestly think it's a gift from above when we wake up negative and we choose to overcome it. Now, when we choose to overcome it, the contrast made it greater. So that's what I'm saying is the top looks a lot better knowing I came from the very bottom under the jail. Some kid who grew up here doesn't fucking notice it. 
but I, I was under the prison. So the top looks that much better. It's contrast. That contrast needs to be created. So we actually see what took place. In all reality, like nothing exists without the other. There couldn't be good without evil. So, I mean, we would unmake positivity if we just, just said, I'm never negative. Well, you ain't positive neither, then, oh boy. Uh, you, then, then you're just a neutral motherfucker. I see a lot of neutral motherfuckers. They're just kind of existing. They ain't living. So, I, I'm curious, man. Um, d- is there something, I mean, dude, you come across obviously just very disciplined to the point where you get joy out of it, right? Because you're like, hey, I'm, I'm going to eat like this and I'm going to work out like this because it makes me a better person. And it's, it's very, very intense. Well, I, I really, I, I operate my life as a lawyer. So I, I, I live in the back of my mind as a witness and I watch myself from a bird's eye view. So I live my life like a movie. And I've taken myself out of how I feel about any of this. Got it. So the point is, is I have a plan. It's adhered to. When I watch myself adhering to the plan, my self-talk just feels, oh, look at that motherfucker. 245 again. He can't be stopped. Who's going to stop him? And so now then I'm going into my meal that's just whatever. It's, I just really eat just some meat. I'll eat eight ounces of bison. I'll wait three hours eat eight, eight ounces more bison. This is what I'll eat. I'll have two shades. Eight ounce of bison, eight ounce of bison, and then two chicken or fish meals. That's how I eat. And then I'll carve up when I start to look like shit and get too wired up. I'll carve up. So it's basically my own carnivore carb cycle. Nobody listening to this should eat like that. You're not going to look like me for eating like that unless you already have a lot of size. If you already have a bunch of muscle, it'll work for you. But if you don't, you have to eat just structured macros, drop fat, and then reverse diet. Go on westwatson.com. I'll show you how to do it. But anyways... The thing is, is I get, I live my life as a voyeur. So I'm watching myself, fueling myself with my self-talk. Just, oh, look at this mother. You can't stop this dude. Look, look at all the stuff he gets done instead. And I, I'm watching myself, my biggest fan. People don't do that. They don't realize that's ethical egoism. Like it's, it's a form of ego, but it's ethical. I'm doing it to then later help. People try to be like, oh, I can't like be like that in my head about myself. What the fuck can't you be? So you're going to choose to do what you do, which is beat on yourself all day and talk shit to yourself. Oh, you're not worth it. Oh, you look like shit. Oh, like the whole thing is, is everybody's got a way backwards. They're not really digging deep into this stuff. And that's what I do. I dig deep into it, show them what the way to really think, act and follow through with building who they need to become. This is fascinating, man. Out of uh, out of seven hundred shows, I've never heard it quite like this. I have I've had Mark Divine on three times. He talks about that part of the mind called the witness. Yeah, that, that, never, that yeah, and I but I've never heard it said quite like that. And so let me let me let me, po- let me pose the theory here. Uh, here's the here's the theory: Is it safe to say that we're so busy? talking poorly about ourselves, listening to that voice between our ears constantly that we never actually even step out to be like, well, wait a second. Let me, let me actually view myself from outside of myself versus like in here. Is, is that, do you think one of the biggest gaps? Well, they're just, they're caught in their feelings. I mean, they're sitting there like, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. It's all about them. Oh, this ain't what I want to do. I just have a plan and have to adhere to it. And my strong witness operating from a bird's eye view that came from the penitentiary. You can't be present in the penitentiary. If, if I was present the whole time and I didn't just watch myself like, Oh, this dude's creating a movie the whole time. I, I walk in the prison gates, like watch what I do with this. I'm turning this into a movie and I turned it into a movie by pulling myself and my feelings out of it. And just watching myself, like, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this motherfucker. And I just separated the two. If I was all in my feelings, then I would have just been like, I don't want to do this. I don't like this tray. I feel like doing this. The whole thing is, is your feelings get in the way of all that. Pros operate from commitment. Amateurs operate from fucking feelings. And I've been a pro since day one. The day I walked in those gates, even when I was a kid snowboarding, I, I had the pro mentality. This is what we have to teach people. It's not about what you feel like doing, motherfucker. What crazy world do you believe exists 
where you get to be who you want to be, do what you want to do, and do, do it exactly how you feel like doing it, motherfucker. As man, everyone told you you couldn't have your cake and eat it too when you were a kid. I still don't even get that one, but we get the gist of it. Yeah, man. Uh, that's a fascinating segment. I like that. I'm going gonna... to. It, it's the biggest. Uh, it's the biggest change I can give to people. Yeah. And, um, the operating from the mental witness. A lot of top mindset people talk about the mental witness, but the penitentiary will force it. The penitentiary will force it because it's too painful. And what I used as my biggest tools in the penitentiary to not go outside those fences, to not create and operate from imaginary evils, to not create false scenarios that weren't suiting my outcome, is I used starvation. I used massive exercise. I used solitude. And the thing was, is when you're really hungry, you don't start going past that. You're like, look it, I'm just fucking hungry, okay? I'm hungry. I could starve anxiety and depression out of any one of you motherfuckers. Like I could put you on such a diet and workout program, you would forget you're anxious and depressed. That is affluenza, motherfucker. You've done, you've gotten your way so much that you ate what you want to eat, you're doing what you want to do, you got everything you need, now you're just going into something else you don't got. Well, I don't have this in the past. Like, it's not like this anymore. Or, and now I'm in the future. What if this happens? Motherfucker shit. Like, you're so fortunate that you just start creating problems that don't even exist, motherfucker. Because you don't got any. Okay? In a penitentiary, anxiety doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Because you can't treat it. Get the fuck on the floor and do push-ups. They're not going to give you fucking Xanax or some pill. You're going to write a fucking medical slip. They're going to say, you got what? Shut the fuck up, dude. Get the fuck back in there, stupid. Say, oh, what? Are you, so you're, me- you're mentally ill? Okay, we're going to put you on some Thoris and then have you walking up and down the yard like a zombie. So drooling on yourself. Here's your choices. Which one you want? And you're like, ah, I'm good with that. But I mean, the point is, is it's affluenza. It's literally depression. Anxiety, depression is a selfish person disease. It's, it's selfish. It's selfish self-talk ran rampant. You people just sit there like, I don't have this. I, I, don't, I don't get to do this. My life isn't like this. It's just sickening. Play a depressed person self-talk on a megaphone, especially some bitch-ass depressed person in America. Like a depressed person in America, just punch him in the fucking face. Like literally, like what are you complaining about? Like, really? Really? You don't got all this? Motherfucker. Like, go to any other country. The homeless people are bones. The homeless people in America are fat and shit. Like, we don't... It's ridiculous. Like, yeah, I get it. I get it. You've spun such a selfish internal dialogue so long that you ended up believing it. No, you got every opportunity in the world, you victim. I came from less than you really quick because I just got to work. You know? And the thing is, is okay, you are feeling that. And you are feeling that you, what you call depression. You know, you know the answer to that, right? Go cure that in somebody else. Anything we wish to have for ourselves, we must give away. So if you know you're feeling like that, how about you quit worrying about yourself for a second? The cure for depression is this. You wake up in the morning and say, how can I best serve everybody else today? And you go fucking do it. You don't wake up and go, but me, but me, 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 me. That's a punishment. Depression is a punishment for you being a selfish motherfucker internally. Man, it's good stuff, Wes. I, 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 um, dude, hey, dude, they got two choices. They got two choices. Believe what I'm saying, sure it. Or believe that the doctor's right and they're really so fucked up and just take all these pills and fuck themselves off worse. Which one you want? I'd say go with me. You end up jacked and in control. The other one, you, you know what happens. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> so let, let's do this, man. As as we as we wind down the show, um, I really want to. I love this. I can Thank tell, you. man. I can tell. Um, which, by the way, I, I've I've really enjoyed the show, man. Um, this this but- is what I love to do. I mean, this is what saved my life. Is this frame of thought. These tactics, these mindset tricks, these gems, just these, these ways to, these fail safes. Yeah. Every time you're coming to a problem, you have one of these fail safes or these core beliefs that negate your negotiations with that internal bitch. That's what people don't get. They're negotiating with that lesser self. And the only way to negate that negotiation is to have a core belief that's stronger than it. 
Every time I don't want to get up at 245, leaders do more, motherfucker. Wes, you're going to lead the whole fucking world. Get up. You got to be up before everybody. Get your fucking ass up. You said you were a leader, right? Fuck you sleeping in for then. How are you going to lead from the back, homeboy? Get up. Is that is that why you wake up unhappy? Because you, you talk to yourself like that? I, I literally wake up and I'm, I'm, so, I'm literally, I wake up just, I just... I just have a fucking desire to be better each day. And then that it's a, it's a negative feeling that turns positive really quickly. And the joy created brings me to tears. The gratitude created. I feel like it rents do even in, in negativity and positivity rents do every day and discipline and your training it's rent rents do every day. If you're not having to overcome it every day, there's a problem. You're not really going to solidify it like me. You know, early, early on in the show, you're, you, you brought up your wife, uh, you, and you started talking about selflessly serving her and your son, Wolf, by the way, still badass name. Um, <laughs> I might name my fifth boy that I'm, I'm not kidding. I have four boys. Um, but you know, talk to us about leading in marriage. Like how do you go about leading your wife, leading your family? Like what, what is your North star when it comes to that, man? Just uh, live and let witness, live and let witness. I, I, I've got my wife to cure her alcoholism for about eight months. And then she relapsed really hard. We had a big problem with it. And now she's back good again. We're working again. How can I say anything? I've relapsed on everything a million times. So the thing is, is literally if we treat people as they are, they'll stay as they are. If we treat them as they should be, they'll be as they should be. I live as they should live. So I treat them as they should be. And they see the benefit to it. They're, and then I'm able to be like, don't you, don't you feel good right now? Like a lot of people will be do this with weight loss. They'll be like, oh, you look better with a little weight on you to their friend, like chicks. And I'm like, why didn't they ask you how you felt? So I always ask people how they feel when they fuck up. How do you feel? And everything that we regret and everything that holds us back, we always feel like shit. Regret's our guideline. If you regret it, it's got to go. And the thing is, is how do I leave from the front with the family is I personify the teaching. I show success. I show results. There's that dumb motherfucking dad who literally goes to the gym every day. He's consistent as fucking his job. He's consistent going to the gym. He's consistent with a lot of shit. He has no fucking results. And it's worse. It makes it less attractive. He, the kid's like, Dad, I see you going to the gym every day. You don't look like the guys on Instagram. The fuck's the matter with you? And he's like, oh, son, they're doing stuff I'm not. Yeah, they're tracking their food, really, you fucking fat idiot. They, li they literally don't get it. It's always a blame game. They're always doing something new. It's not that what you're not doing, homeboy. And the thing is, is there's nothing more, there's nothing more common than a consistent motherfucker who doesn't get his results. There's nothing more common than a talented dude who's unsuccessful. And it's because their comprehension is lacking. They literally go to the gym each day, but they don't understand how to diet correctly. They literally go to a job and they don't understand how business is done in 2021. They literally are in a relationship and they don't know how to control their subconscious thoughts and their energy. So here's the guy in his relationship. And his wife's like, can you do the dishes, honey? And it's been like a 10-hour day, 12-hour day. He's tired. And he says, yeah, and he does the dishes. But his subconscious thoughts are like, you fucking bitch, you should have done them. You've been at home all day. And his energy is just so vile towards her that it didn't matter that he did the dishes. She knew what the fuck he was saying. And he's been doing that for 12 years, 15 years. Their relationship is gone at that point. So I call that, what I call that is literally the, that's, that's the time where we show who we are. That's literally the inconvenience factor, the inconvenience factor when it hasn't been a 15 hour day and they are coming up to you to test you. Honey, can you go get diapers? Like, I don't feel good. Right then. Yes. The actions. Yes. And the subconscious thoughts are aligned with your goals. Yes, I'll go get them. Let me show you right now when, when, it's, when I'm very inconvenienced how much I love you. Because it matters most now. Not when it's all perfect and life is perfect. Oh, yeah, that fits my schedule perfectly. I'll go get them. No, when you're inconvenienced, that's who you are, motherfucker. And so, yes, I'll go get them. I have no change in energy. 
Subconscious thoughts are, I love you so much, I would die for you. Obviously, after a 12-hour day, I'll go get the diapers. It's nothing. That foolish-ass motherfucker, I would die for you, honey. But then when 12-hour day comes in, and he, he's supposed to get some diapers, in his day, in his mind, he's just villain. He just, she's just the villain of all villains. I mean, people just don't understand what they're doing because they operate from the very lowest level of the accountability pyramid, which is actions. Yeah, I'll go get them. Whole way down there, fucking bitch. And their energy's just all, and their, their energy's just sour towards her. They come back, throw them on the table, even. And you don't even think he did anything because he went and got them, you know? Well, I got them, you know? And this is, this is how I used to be. This is how people are. I see people like this all the time. But um, really, when you can control the whole accountability pyramid, you can control your actions, you can control your subconscious thoughts, and you can control your energy and then make them all in alignment towards your end outcome in the relationship, in the fitness and nutrition, and in your business, in your personal life. This is how you're going to win. I mean, the point is, is most people can't even be accountable to the actions. So they don't even know how to move up to their subconscious thoughts or their energy, once you're accountable to your daily non-negotiable actions, then you automatically exist from thought. So I have my wake-up time, I have the foods I eat, I have the workouts I do, I do what I do in my business. Now I don't even have to spend energy down there negotiating. Everyone spends all their energy, energy negotiating with whether they're gonna do the action or not. I don't spend any energy negotiating. So all my energy goes towards my thoughts and me, my, my core beliefs smashing the negotiations. So now I'm just strengthening core beliefs through my self-talk. When the negotiations come about, nope, leader. Nope, I work out. Nope, gotta be swole for my son. Nope, my wife has to fucking be attracted to me. Nope, and I'm just crushing. So now I'm just strengthening these core beliefs all day long. No negotiation, no deviation in action. And then once the core beliefs are, are structured like mine are, they're just on autopilot, which is called auto-suggestion. So now I'm using conscious auto-suggestion to continually brainwash myself into this. I do it with my wife all day. I do it with my workouts. I do it with my wake-up time. Wake-up time, I'm sitting there going, nobody out. Nobody out works me. I'll never sleep in. This is nothing to me. I'll never break. I'll never break. And I'm just doing this naturally. And then when I'm thinking about my wife and a beautiful picture of her, I'm walking down the halls. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you so much. I love you. And it just, this is how I get so good at shit quick is through conscious auto-suggestion in the areas that it's suiting my goal. And then above that is I'm making sure my energy is always in a line and accountable to it. If I have an energy deviation that's not in line with my goals, I'm accountable to it. If I had an energy slip with you or with someone or employee or my wife or anybody, I'd be like, hey, my bad. Like, I'm having a downturn in energy right now. Let me go pick this up. I will literally go work out real quick if I have to, if the, if the area suits that. I'll go do 100 burpees and come back. People are like, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't fit my life. It's like, okay, well, then just being an asshole low energy does. Which choice do you want, motherfucker? Like, I'm not going to come on this call with low energy. I'm going to smash 200 burpees, read some quotes that get me vibing, and I'm going to come back in, and I'm going to make sure that I come in high energy. I, I really feel like one of the biggest things we can do in life is to be accountable to our vibration and our energy so that we are a motivating force, so that we are showing people to be grateful. We are showing people that positivity isn't something that's bought in a fucking bag or in a bottle. Yeah, man. I, uh, I love the non-negotiable structure that you have in there. And I also, the other thing too, is a lot of people don't see exactly what you just said. It's like, okay, well, I can go do a hundred burpees and bring my energy up, or I can just be low energy and a pain in the rear end to be around right now. So choose which one you want, right? Well, it's just how, how much do you really love and respect these people? Right. I, I really love, I really, I'm a perfectionist. A trait of a perfectionist is they want to be loved and accepted. It's a good thing as long as you don't beat yourself up too much. Perfection will not be achieved but understand this and use it to your benefit. The people who fucking suck in this life are the people who, who act like they don't want to be accepted so that they can be lazy and not put in no fucking work. You are definitely a no excuse, no nonsense type of guy, my friend. I got it. We're, this, this is the top floor. This is the top floor. We're not at the bottom yeah. floor. We're not, we're not in the shoe. We're not at the bottom floor. But... You know, this, this is how you get there. There's no excuses. It's very easy when you don't give excuses. A lot of energy is wasted towards excuses. Negative thoughts are very expensive and uh, negotiations are extremely expensive. It's awesome, man. Dude, I, I've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed I've this, man. Crushed it. Like literally loved it. Let me go get this dude.
Oh, you got the little dude. He's bringing the little man. Hey, for those of you guys, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. We're about ready to meet Wolf. Yes, yes, yes. Wes has got some flavor, doesn't he? He's got some flair. Very intense guy. Here he comes. Here he comes. This is a monster right here. What's up, bud? Ah, what's up, bud? Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> can, he, can he can he throw up one of the guns? Can he? Does he do that? <laughs> what's up, we do it. <laughs> Will he? Uh, hey, hey, Wolf! You give me a fist bump. Right up here. Give me a bump. Give, give, me, a bump. Bump. give me a bump. Oh, oh there, yeah. there you go. Oh, yeah. Nice job, man. Nice job. Oh, hey, awesome. man. I love you, bro. Hey, man. I just oh. want to. Tell you, I, I want to tell you something, man. You you freaking lit up when you had him in your arms. He's the best. I, yeah. I, I seriously, I hadn't seen him for a month until I saw him yesterday because me and Mark actually had a big problem. We had a we had a big falling out. We we know. We were coming to a crossroads of our relationship and something happened and, um, you know, it was just uh, a high level of forgiveness and um, me preaching what I always say, do what's hard. And, and um, you know, we got through it. And the thing is, is um, we just love each other too much and that's it. I don't explanations. Friends don't need them. Enemies won't believe them. I ain't going to sit there and explain everything. I know my heart. I know where I'm supposed to be. And, and that's it, you know, and they, they needed me and, uh, and that's just, that's just what we do. You know? I hear you, man. Hey, I want to make sure all the guys can find everything that you're doing, man. So I know you're big on Instagram. I know you got your website, but share uh, where everybody can find everything you're doing, man. Okay. So YouTube is GP penitentiary life with Wes Watson. We got over 52 million views. What's up, bud? Baby shark. <laughs> <laughs> now, Wes, um, uh, you know, I, I'll give you mad props if you bust out some baby, sh some, some daddy shark, you know, lyrics right now. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but, um, the, so YouTube penitentiary life, 52 million views. Um, it's GP penitentiary life with Wes Watson. And then we got, um, uh, Wes And then we got uh, Watson underscore fit on uh, Instagram. And then, um, we have the podcast, which is GP penitentiary life podcast. That's on, um, uh, Spotify, Apple, Apple one, and then uh, also the other one. I don't know. We're across all three uh, big podcast platforms. Cool, man. Well, hey guys, don't even worry about it. I'll have all the links in the show notes for you. Head on over to gooddadproject.com. This made my day, bro. I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, man. You got to be solid role models. There's too many people dropping the ball. Thank you. Indeed, man. Indeed. Gentlemen, go to gooddadproject.com forward slash 310 for this show. Again, gooddadproject.com forward slash 310. We'll have all of Wes's links in there for you. You can connect with him there. Wes, thank you, man. This was fun. This was so fun. Happy. Loved it. L yeah, literally, literally made my day, man. I appreciate it. Hey, same here, man. Same here. Well, dude, hey, seriously, go out and live legendary, my friend, as you continue to, to do that very thing. That's what we got to do is, I mean, just everyone really appreciates you telling them to live a better day, live a better life and, and then embodying it. That's all we can do is uh, literally just step it up and, and be, be the man we need. You know? be, be the man we need. That's right, man. Love be, it, bro. I love it too, man. Hey, have a good rest of your day, man. This was fun. Thank you so all much. Right. Later, See bro. Bye-bye.